by Mia Toki Mu Toku Movie to to Toku Toku That's the one. All right, Daniel, you can you can actually start. We're going. All right, welcome back to yet another DJ Tone recording. We're back apparently. Today we're reading In the Name of Love by Mia Tokumitsu. All right. Do what you love is the mantra for today's worker. Why should we assert our class interest if, according to DYU all elites like Steve Jobs, there's no such thing as work? Do what you love. Love what you do. The commands are framed and perched in a living room that can only be described as well curated. A picture of this room appeared first on a popular design blog, but has been pinned, tumbled, and linked like thousands of times by now. Lovingly lit and photographed, this room is styled to inspire Roughly translatable from German as a pleasurable yearning for some utopian thing or place. Despite the fact that it introduces expectations to labor into a space of leisure, the do what you love living room where artful tickle around the work around abound and work (laughs) is not drudgery but love is precisely the place (laughs) all these pinners and likers long to be the dip tack arrangement suggests a secular version of medieval house altar there's little doubt that do what you love dwyl is now the unofficial work mantra for our time the problem is that it leads not to salvation but to the devaluation of actual work including the very work it pretends to elevate, and more importantly, the dehumanization of the vast majority of laborers. Superficially, DWIL is an uplifting piece of advice, urging us to ponder what it is we most enjoy doing, and then turn that activity into a wage-generating enterprise. But why should our pleasure be for profit? Who is the audience for this dictum? Who is not? By keeping us focused on ourselves and our individual happiness, DWYL distract us from working conditions of others while validating our own choices and relieving us from obligations to all who labor, whether or not they love it. It is the secret handshake of the privileged and a worldview that disguises its elitism and as noble self-betterment. According to this way of thinking, labor is not something one does for compensation, but an act of self-love. If profit doesn't happen to follow it is because the workers passion and determination were insufficient its real achievement is making workers believe their labor serves as serves the self and not the marketplace aphorisms have numerous origins and reincarnations but the gener- generic and hackneyed nature of do what you love confounds precise attribution oxford reference links the phrase and variants of it to martina Navra- navratilova and francis Rebelles, among others The internet frequently attributes it to Confucius, locating it in a misty, orientalized past. Oprah Winfrey and other peddlers of positivity have included it in their repertoires for decades, but the most important recent evangelist of the do-what-you-love creed is deceased Apple CEO Steve Jobs. His graduation speech to the Stanford University class of 2005 provides us as good an origin myth as any, especially since Jobs had already been beatified as the patron saint of aesthetically work well uh, aestheticized work well before his early death. In the speech, Jobs recounts the creation of Apple and inserts this reflection. You've got to find what you love, and that is as true for your work for your work as it is for your lovers. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. In these four sentences, the words you and your appear eight times. The focus on the individual is hardly surprising coming from Jobs, who cultivated a very specific image of himself as a worker, inspired, casual, passionate, all states agreeable with ideal romantic love. Jobs telegraphed the con- the confirmation of his besotted worker self with, it, with his company so effectively that his black turtleneck and blue jeans became menoms for all of Apple and the labor that maintains it. But by portraying Apple as a labor of his individual love, Jobs elided the labor of untold thousands in Apple's factories, conveniently hidden from sight on the other side of the planet, the very labor that allowed Jobs to actualize his love. The violence of this erasure needs to be exposed. While do what you love sounds harmless and precious, it is ultimately self-focused to the point of narcissism. Jobs' formulation of do what you love is the depressing antithesis to Henry David Thoreau's utopian utopian vision of labor for all. In Life Without Principle, Thoreau wrote, 
it would be good for the economy or it would be good economy for a town to pay its laborers so well that they would not feel that they were working for low ends as for livelihood merely but for scientific even moral ends do not hire a man who does your work for money but him who does it for the love of it a man who lays throw had little feel for the prolier it's hard to imagine something watch some someone washing diapers for scientific even moral ends no matter how well paid but he nonetheless maintains that society has a stake in making work well compensated and meaningful. By contrast, the 21st century and Jobsian view demands that we all turn inward. It absolves us of any obligation to or acknowledge of the wild world, or acknowledgement of the wild world. Wider world. Wow. Underscoring its fundamental betrayal of all workers, whether they consciously embrace it or not. One consequence of this isolation is the division that do what you love creates among workers, largely among class lines. Work becomes divided into two opposing classes, that which is lovable, creative, intellectual, socially prestigious, and that which is not, repetitive, unintellectual, undistinguished. Those in the lovable work camp are vastly more privileged in terms of wealth, social status, education, society's racial biases, and political clout, while comprising a small minority of the workforce. For those forced into unlovable work, it is a different story. Under the DWIL credo, labor that is done out of motives or needs other than love, which is in fact most labor, is not only demeaned but erased. As in Jobs' Stanford speech, unlovable but socially necessary work is banished from the spectrum of consciousness altogether. Think of the great variety of work that allowed Jobs to spend even one day SEO. His food harvest harvested from fields that trans then transported across great distances. His company's goods assembled, packaged, shipped. Apple advertisements scripted, cast, filmed. Lawsuits processed. Office waste baskets emptied and ink cartridges filled. Job creation goes both ways. Yet, with the vast majority of workers eff effectively invisible to elites busy in their lovable occupations, how can it be surprising that the heavy strains f faced by today's workers, abysmal rages, massive child care costs, that barely register as political issues even among the liberal faction of the ruling class. In ignoring most work and reclassifying the rest as love, do what you love may be the most elegant anti-worker ideology around. Why should workers assemble and assert their class interests if there's no such thing as work? Do what you love disguises the fact that being able to choose a career primarily for personal reward is an unmerited privilege, a sign of that person's socioeconomic class. Even if a self-employed graphic designer had parents who could pay for art school and co-sign a lease for a slick Brooklyn apartment, she can self-righteously bestow do what you love as career advice to those covetous of her success. If we believe that willingness, if we believe that working as a Silicon Valley entrepreneur or a museum publicist or a think tank acolyte is essential to being true to ourselves, in fact, to loving ourselves, what do we believe about the inner lives and hopes for those who clean hotel rooms and stock shelves at big box stores? The answer is nothing. Yet arduous, low-wage work is what ever more Americans do and will be doing. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, the two fastest-growing occupations projected until 2020 are personal care aid and home care aid, with average salaries of $19,640 per year and $20,560 per year in 2010, respectively. Elevating certain types of professions to something worthy of love necessarily denigrates the labor of those who do unglamorous work that keeps society functioning, especially the crucial work of caregivers. If DWYL de 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 denigrates or makes dangerously invisible vast swaths of labor that allows many of us to live in comfort and do what we love, it has also caused great damage to the professions it pretends to celebrate, especially those jobs existing within institutional structures. Nowhere has the DWYL mantra been more devastating to its adherents than in academia. The average PhD student of the mid-2000s, for want the easy money of finance and law, now slightly less easy, to live on a meager stipend in order to pursue their passions for Norse mythology or the history of Afro-Cuban music. The reward for answering this, highly call, this higher calling is an academic employment marketplace in which about around 41% of American faculty are adjunct professor, contract instructors who usually receive low pay, no benefits, no office, no job security, and no long-term stake in the schools where they work. There are many factors that keep PhDs providing such high-skilled labor for such extremely, extremely low wages, including path dependency and the sunk costs of earning a PhD. 
but one of the strongest is how pervasively the do-what-you-love doctrine is embedded in academia. Few other professions fuse the personal identity of their workers so intimately with the work output. This intense identification partly explains why so many proudly left-leaning faculty remain oddly silent about the working conditions of their peers. Because academic research should be done out of pure love, the actual conditions of and compensation for this labor become afterthoughts, if they are considered at all. In academic labor, the aesthetics of management and the promise of autonomous work, Sarah Brouillet writes of academic faculty. Our faith that our work offers non-material rewards and is more integral to our identity than a regular job would be makes us ideal employees when the goal of management is to extract our labor's maximum value at minimum cost. Many academics like to think they have avoided a corporate work environment and its attended values, but Mark Bus Busquet notes in his essay, We Work, that academia may actually provide a model for co corporate management. How to emulate the academic workplace and get people to work at a high level of intellectual and emotional intensity for 50 or 60 hours a week for bartender wagers or less? Is there any way we can get our employees to soon over their desk, murmuring, I love what I do, in response to greater workloads and smaller paychecks? How can we get our workers to be like a faculty and deny that they work at all? How can we adjust our corporate culture, cor culture to resemble campus culture so that our workforce will fall in love with their work too? No one is arguing that enjoyable work should be less so. But emotionally satisfying work is still work, and acknowledging it as such doesn't undermine it in any way. Refusing to acknowledge it, on the other hand, opens the door to the most vicious exploitation and harms all workers. Ironically, DWIL reinforces exploitation even within the so-called lovable professions, where if off-the-clock underpaid or unpaid labor is the new norm. Reporters required to do the work of their laid-off photographers, publicists expected to pin and tweet on weekends, the 46% of the workforce expected to check their work email on sick days. Nothing makes exploitation go down easier than convicting workers that they're doing what they love. Instead of crafting a nation of self-fulfilled, happy workers, our do-what-you-love era has seen the rise of adjunct professor and unpaid intern, people persuaded to work for cheap or free or even for a net loss of wealth. This has certainly been the case for all of those interns working for college credit or those who actually purchase ultra-desirable fashion house internships at auction. Valentino and Bal Balenciaga are among a handful of houses that auctioned off monthly long inter internships for charity, of course. The latter is worker exploitation taken to its most taken to its most extreme, and as an ongoing ProPublica investigation reveals, the unpaid intern is an ever larger presence in the American workforce. It should be no surprise that unpaid interns abound in fields that are highly socially desirable, including fashion, media, and the arts. These industries have long been accustomed to masses of employees willing to work for social currency instead of actual wages, all in the name of love. Excluded from these opportunities, of course, is the overwhelming majority of the population, those who need to work for wages. This exclusion not only calcifies economic and professional immobility, but insulates these industries from the full diversity of voices society has to offer. And it's no coincidence that the industries that rely heavily on interns, fashion, media, and the arts just happen to be the feminized ones, as Madeline Schwartz wrote in Dissent. Yet another damaging con consequence of DWIL is how ruthlessly it works to extract female labor for little or no compensation. Women com comprise the majority of the low-wage or unpaid workforce. As care workers, adjunct faculty, and unpaid interns, they outnumber men. What unites all this work, whether performed by GEDs or PhDs, is the belief that wages shouldn't be the primary motivation for doing it. Women are supposed to do work because they are natural nurturers and are eager to please. After all, they've been doing uncompensated childcare, elder care, and housework since time immemorial, and taking money is unladylike anyway. The do what you love dream is true to its American mythology, superficially democratic. PhDs can do what they love, making careers that indulge their love of the Victorian novel and writing thoughtful essays in the New York Review of Books. High school grads can do it all, can also do it, building prepared food empires out of their Aunt Pearl's jam recipe. The hollowed path of the entre entrepreneur always offers this way out of disadvantaged beginnings, excusing the rest of us for allowing those beginnings to be as miserable as they are. In America, everyone has the opportunity to do what he or she loves and get rich. 
Do what you love, and you'll never work a day in your life. Before succumbing to the intoxicating warmth of that promise, it's critical to ask, who, exactly, benefits from making work feel like non-work? Why should workers feel as if they aren't working when they are? Historian Mario Liverani reminds us that ideology has the function of presenting exploitation in a favorable light to the exploited, as advantageous to the disadvantaged. In masking the very exploitative mechanisms of labor that it fuels, DWIL is in fact the most perfect ideological tool of capitalism. It shunts aside the labor of others and disguises our own labor to ourselves. It hides the fact that if we acknowledge all of our work as work, we could set appropriate limits for it, demanding fair compensation and humane schedules that allow for family and leisure time. If we did that, more of us could get around to doing what it is we really love. Sweet. That article got a lot more in depth. That's cool. And that was In the Name of Love by DJ21 The Boys. <laughs> Woo! Don't forget to subscribe! They said the same exact thing, only this one was just longer. More explain. It's fine. It, it got into the, the issues with capitalism before our econ class did. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. uh, well, okay. had you read the chapter when you were supposed to, what? it would have. <laughs> what? Chapter 2. I already read chapter, chapter two. Chapter two said it will get to it eventually. It it didn't start actually listing the the issues yet. Oh, the the yeah, the issues. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that was a sick little recording. That was our tiny discussion on the end of it. No, it's yeah, it was kind of yeah. It was Come to our podcast, podcast this Sunday. For All right, yeah, we're premiering a new pilot. Do what you love. The untitled podcast work work working title not not complete yet yeah yeah it's a work in progress uh all right thanks for watching have a have a dandy day don't forget to smash the hit like button to, to hate to, to subscribe <laughs>